he's learning already. He's learning to not put the can down too hard on the table. This is a man who's watched some podcasts. <laughs> anyway, bang, everyone who's listening, welcome back. Sonny Webster's joined me today. How are you? Very well, thank you. What's happening? Long drive today. Long drive, five hours in the car, decent training session considering. Very decent training session and worth it, obviously, to see me. Of course. I'm looking forward to <laughs> the later part of tonight's antics. Yes, of course. Um, those of you who know what I, uh, how I perceive drinking, I'm going to suspend my drinking habits or my lack of drinking habits for one evening. I can Bearing talk about it. in mind when I met you, you I were was on still a six months Six sober. months sobriety stint. Yeah, exactly. And we still went out and you were there like... Itching. <laughs> it was difficult, but that was at the end of it. That was like I had like two, two weeks, weeks to go. Yeah, fair. It was not easy, but yeah, that was um, that was still a really fun night at Body, at body Power in Birmingham. So good because we literally met like a few hours before that as well, and we just like click. Yeah, it's cool, man. Wow. It's awesome. Mm. So anyone who's watching on the brand new Modern Wisdom YouTube channel, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. If you don't know what Sunny does, Video Mandine will make it appear. Here. And here. And also here. So, Sonny is uh, an Olympic weightlifter, represented Great Britain at Rio. Yeah, 2016. Um, And now you are travelling the world doing weightlifting seminars and coaching people, doing a lot of PT work. Having a lot of fun. Having an awful lot of fun and being a big dick Instagram swinger and (laughs) all the rest of the stuff, man. So... For the people who don't know who you are and for the people who do, can you give us a background? How did you start in weightlifting? What, where does it go? Where do you begin? Yeah, well, I guess I have to take you right back to me even as a kid and go back and talk about, I guess, um, what got me into sport. Like, I mean, I've always been sporty as a kid. You know, you get those kids that are the sporty kids and then you get the kids that are more artistic, etc. I was always a sporty kid. Um, my dad was always into golf so that naturally before I could pretty much walk my dad had golf uh, club my hands and I even remember like he still got videos like on you know the old video recorders like the tapes mm-hmm. of him trying to teach me and he's so brutal with me like, <laughs> my golf swing's pure and he's like that's wrong it's bad and I'm there like, <laughs> like golf swing. three years old yeah so um, my dad always like was pushing me with my sport um, and going back to sort of like year when do you start, like, primary school? Year five. Are you five years old? Yeah, so from primary school, really, up to, and that goes up to, what, year six, doesn't it? So during that time of school, um, I was in, like, all the sort of school clubs, like gymna- gymnastics, um, you know, athletics. The cricket ball throw was my event. Um, nice. 80 metre sprint until you get to year six and it became 100. And I'd like. That last 20 metres just <laughs> killed you. Just killed me. I was always like little, like stocky, like obviously my mum's from New Zealand, so I've got a bit of Maori in me. Mm-hmm. So, like, got that stocky sort of build, and I'd be like off for like the first like 40, and then I'd hang on to the 80 <laughs> metres. As soon as it became like 100 metres, I was finished. It was always about being the fastest kid at school as well, wasn't yeah. it? So. Um, yeah, that finished me there. I tried high jump. Obviously, these little stumps are no good at that. Uh, <laughs> long jump was okay, but again, not great. And slowly realised that I was a kid that was good at lots of things, but great at nothing. Yeah. Um, and I always tell the story because there's one like key point for me in, I guess, my Olympic journey, if you like, that stands out for me. I don't know what it is about this moment, but it still like sticks in my head, but... I remember being sat in maths class in school, year, I would have been, oh, year five probably, um, and it's, I'm going to say 2000 and, maybe it's 2002, and I'm sat in maths class doing maths, and um, in the, the way that my school was, it was like three classrooms and they were divided by like sliding the doors, and the PE teacher come running in, burst open one of these sliding doors, was like, stop! we got to turn the TV on and there was only one TV in, um, in the school. And so we were like, right, fine. That like better, good. better than maths. We'll yeah. watch a bit of TV. And, uh, Miss Cousins, I think the PE teacher name was, and she flipped the TV on. And it was right at the moment when David Beckham and Kelly Holmes were jumping up and down, hugging each other. 
And do you know what that what I'm on about? No. Okay, so it's right when we won the bid for London 2012 Olympics, because obviously them two were like key Ambassadors. figures. Yeah, of like the... Um, of the... Campaign. Yeah, the campaign. So um, that moment just sticks out for me as something as like my first real recollection of the Olympics and what it was. And I don't know what it is about that moment, but it still like makes me feel happy now. But mm-hmm. it was just how much it meant to them made me feel from like right from that moment. Like I want to be part of that. I want that feeling, whatever that is. And um, after them, for the next sort of couple of weeks, I guess, in school, they did a lot of like classes around the Olympics, what it was to obviously educate us as to what mm-hmm. the Olympic Games was. And um, at that time, I could could have told you every golfer in the top ten, of, but <laughs> knew nothing about what, you know any Olympic sports. So we learned all that, and um, I guess then we got into year six, and again I continued with the sports that I was doing, and you know, pundled sort of along, and then um, we ended up moving down from year six to year seven down to a school in Ivybridge. So this is back in Reading. Um, down to Ivebridge, which is a little town in um, Devon near Plymouth. And, so you are um, on the arse end of the country there. Yeah. Like, so, you're as far well, away from you here as possible. You can go Cornwall. Oh, yeah, true, true. But yeah, long Pretty south. south. Yeah, so it started for year six, um, year seven then at this new school. And naturally when you start a new school and you don't know anyone, you're kind of like that loner. And at the time I was living with my dad when we moved down there, when we first went down there. And... I remember, like, my first day at this school and, like, you know how, like, your mum makes your pat lunches mm-hmm. and she can because it's your mum and yeah. they know how to make pat lunch. Yeah. And then it was, like, my dad was making me this pat lunch <laughs> and, like, bless me, tried too hard, but at the same time, I didn't know what the fuck he was doing. <laughs> so you just roll you into school with a single baguette and, like... Yeah, pretty much, like, uh, yeah, go in the shop and get what you want. And you're like, no, you went to slice my on. sandwiches and triangles, <laughs> dad, <but laughs> So I just remember that first day being like absolutely horrendous, wanting to cry. <laughs> shit like, back lunch. Yeah, <laughs> shit back lunch. Starting this new school and just being like, oh God, this is fuck. horrendous. Yeah, yeah, fuck. New school. And it was a big school as well. Okay. And it was it was Ibridge Community College and it's really well renowned, known for its sport, mm-hmm. which is half the reason why we went there. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like um, a community college. So it was like a normal public school mm-hmm. not private yeah and um yeah so started in this in this school no mates like shit at lunch and <laughs> i decided at lunch times um that i'd go and sit in the weightlifting gym and uh so your school had a weightlifting gym yes and that we must were, be very rare i uh, think the, you'd probably be able to count the number of schools mm, on one hand who, two at the time when i started there was only two schools in the country that offered weightlifting as part of the GCSE curriculum. So you could do it as like a, um, as part of your PE, GCSE. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, only two. The other one was in Birmingham, I think, Baverstock. So yeah, really rare to come across this. Uh, but we did have also a golf academy even at, in that, that school as well. So I, in the summer, I eventually joined the golf academy as well. But anyway, so I went and sat in this, weightlifting gym and I guess each year maybe 60 or 70 students sign up to weightlifting club Mm -hmm. at lunchtime Mm -hmm. um, from year seven Um, but I wasn't really interested I was just like killing my lunch times basically watching people do it because nothing else (laughs) so So I guess I've been there for nearly two weeks um, before the coach came up to me and said look you've been in now two weeks you're weirding everyone out. You're weirding everyone out. You're also <laughs> that, taking... That, the, that pack lunch is fucking shit. Yeah, you're taking the piss out of, like, some of the kids giving it a go. And the coach is just kind of like, come have a go yourself. Yeah. Like, or fuck off, basically. Yeah, take your shit pack lunch. Yeah. Go so, um, I was like, at the time, like, I didn't know that, that it was an Olympic sport and I wasn't really, like, uh, for me, sort of thing. I was like, I'm, I'm a golfer, whatever. <laughs> um, and... The coach said, look, now, come on, you've got to come tomorrow lunchtime. Like, and um, I thought, like, so after I had my arm twist, I was like, fuck it, I'll go along and have a go. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the next lunchtime I went along. And purely because I'd sat there watching people do it, like anything, if you watch someone do it enough, you have a pretty good idea of what you need to do. Yeah. Um, and I'd done that. 
And after the first session, the coach came over to me and said, like, did did the, the, the other coach teach how to do that? And I was like, no, no, I've just been watching. Like, I knew what I needed to do. And they were like, she was like, fuck, sort of thing. And she was like, um, you got detention every lunchtime until you want to be here, essentially. <laughs> so that's how I spent the rest of my time um, in the school was practicing the input weight of thing. And it started off, so fell into it by chance, but then it started off just being like a lunchtime thing. I'd go in for an hour of lunch and do my weightlifting and I made some friends through that. Mm-hmm. Um, so then it became something that we do, get up and go and do an hour before school. And then it became like before school, lunchtime and after school. And um, yeah, I mean, within the first, I remember my first competition, which was about six months after I started and it was actually at my school. And uh I remember crying because I didn't uh, didn't get all my lifts. I think I got five out of my six lifts and started crying. <laughs> a perfectionist at an early age then. Yes, always. So, um, yeah, that's, I guess, from me, childhood to initially finding weightlifting. Yeah, that's interesting. What I think is really interesting is that you've said about um, your capacity to be able to look and then turn the movement just from visually seeing someone else do it. I think that's definitely the mark of a good athlete. But everyone learns differently. And I find this even as a coach now where sometimes I can say something to one of the guys I'm coaching and they go, yeah, bang and do it. Yeah. Someone needs you to show them a visual cue of them. Like, you know, you actually doing a demonstration Mm -hmm. for them to understand. Some people need to see themselves in order to be able to interpret what they need to do wrong. Some people just don't get it at all. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But that's the thing. And everyone learns differently. And I think I've always been very visual in the way that that I learned that. Yeah, the ability for you, the proprioception to understand where your body is from having just seen something, Mm. I think is definitely the mark of someone that has a natural athletic talent. And I think the fact that you've started so young doing the golf swing, golf's very fine, tuned movement. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Very precise. And I can say the same for myself to a degree. I did cricket for 10 years and that's exactly the same. It's very technique based. And when... I started with Jordan at Reebok CrossFit Tyneside. I was able to pick up, like, the first time that he taught me to do a muscle-up, I got a muscle-up. The first time he taught yeah. me to do toes to you have an awareness of your body and, yeah. like, what, what is being asked to do? A hundred percent. I think that people don't like to hear that there's a lot of natural, uh, a big natural component in success within sport because it takes away someone's hard work capacity to get to the top. Mm-hmm. But the bottom line is that some children... And adults that start sports will naturally be able to learn yes. faster. Yeah. They'll be able to pick it up more quickly. So you've started your weightlifting. You're doing it up to, what, three hours a day now? Yeah, so, um, yeah, I was doing up to... What I what you lift? Is it, is it 11 or 12-year-old? What's you, What are your lifts? Can you remember so what your openers were? I can go, I can tell you sort of what I was lifting at 12. I would have been snatching around 70 kilos. 12, 13, about 70 kilos, clean jerking around 90. At 12 and 13 years old. Yeah, at 50. There's crossfitters up and down the yeah. country that are listening to this that are burying their head in their hands right at now. At 55 kilo body weight or something like that. <laughs> I used to compete in the 56 kilo class. Hang on, you were 55 kilos at 12 years old? Yeah. No, no, I would have been... I started... When I first started, I was 46 and then went up to 45. But the lightest men's category is uh, 56 kilo. So mm-hmm. that was like my category that I competed in. <laughs> so yeah, I suppose then we're nearly two years in um, and it's about, yeah, two years in. So I maybe it would have been 13 when I did those weights. Yep. And um, I'd won everything, like the British under 13s, British under 16s, under 17s. I broke the records, thought I was the dog's bollocks. <laughs> I was now gone from like Billy No Mates in school to really obviously popular kid in the school. Jock. Yeah, like... And uh, I got selected for my first um, international. Then mm-hmm. I would have been, like I said, 13, 14. It was a European 17s in Pavia. So you're competing against 17-year-olds at yeah. the age of 13 or 14. Yeah, but that didn't bother me. I was like, I'm going to smash bring, this as well. I've never lost. So I was like, let's be having this and I'll win this as well. <laughs> Cocky, definitely. <laughs> um, and I went to the competition and ended up getting six out of six. Broke the British rec- my, my own British records by kilo in each lift. Yes. Finished 22nd out of 23. <laughs> that was only because 23 bombed out. <laughs> Bollock last. And 
I again, I remember that feeling of getting like working, watching the scoreboard, going, "What's going on here? Like, am I in the right category? Like, surely you got my name. You got there was name women on. outlifting me, the whole shebang." And I was like, "Wow!" Shit. So, uh, yeah, one of the best things that happened to me though, so early on as a kid in sport, because I very quickly realised that it wasn't about being the best kid in your country or the best at your age you had to look so much further past being the best in your pond if you wanted to compete at the highest level. Mm-hmm. And yeah, like I said, one of the best uh, one of the best lessons I learned really early on. Humbling, um, I suppose, when you said you, you were kind of big dick in it for a little while mm-hmm. and yeah, bringing yourself back down to earth was probably what, what you needed. Yeah, to but at the time, obviously you don't notice it, but I look back and reflect now on my career because, I mean, I've been doing it 12, 13 years. I've had a lot of years lifting in me and there's set definitely certain points of my career that I pinpoint and go, that was a turning point or that was when things went to the next level. So how did you react once that had happened? What happened to your training and what happened to your approach to the sport overall? Yeah, so over the, the next couple of years of coming back from that, I decided that I needed to work much harder in my training and, you know, the, I just started working a lot harder than the other guys, but... At the same time, straight after that, so 2000 and coming to 2008, just shortly after that first international, um, I actually ended up um, having my back injury. Okay. So um, it started off just being like a nervy pain in my back when I was lifting and I was like, it just didn't feel comfortable. But it progressed to the point where I couldn't walk. I was in that much pain. How old are you here? So 2008, so that's 10 years ago now, so it would have been, like, yeah, 14 years old. Right. And, yeah. So it's a young age to be having a, what feels like a severe problem. A severe problem to the point where I ended up having crutches for eight weeks because to help me walk around school because I like, couldn't do anything. You weren't able to train, you weren't able to walk Nothing, crutches. nothing. And obviously that made me like extremely upset even at that age because like, I was training every day and that was... Huge part life. of your life. Yeah, already at that age. So um, we went to see a physio, um, and it was actually Tom Daly's physio at the time, Amanda Booth, because my coach, when I first started, Michaela Breeze, was a uh, Commonwealth me- uh, gold medalist. She'd been to the Olympic Games. She was my first coach. Um, so she took me to see this Amanda Booth, and um, she was like, God, this bad. I've not seen anything like this before. Go see a doctor. Um, so then we went up to Bath University from Devon to uh, see a back specialist there and have the scan. And obviously the scan came back and it was like, at the time I only had two dehydrated discs. So I've had one extra one since. So I had like two dehydrated discs. Dehydrated? Yeah. So basically you obviously got fluid in your disc. Okay. And so I know if you're in it's like compressed. So okay. dehydrated disc. So instead of them being like that thick, it was like that. So I already had that, like mm-hmm. compression of my discs. Um, and then basically um, sacrum first vertebrae were fused together so um, that put pressure then on the disc above because obviously you'd have an extra disc there normally Mm -hmm. that if you imagine when your back goes into flexion gives you a nice curve curve. but because mine was like this to begin with and you'll still see my back when I set my back the first bit of it stays flat (laughs) and then I get my curve (laughs) But obviously that's someone shoved a rod in it. Yeah, but obviously that disc then above where the two are fused has to take more force. Yeah. And it caused it to um come out basically. Slip protrude, yeah. Um slightly. And then because I was so young, the bone, because my bones are growing, the osteophytes had grown over the top of the disc, like out over the disc to like protect it I guess okay and that's what was actually pushing on my sciatica nerve causing okay. the the pain the pain so, so you've, the, you've walked in and you're just like a glossary book of back injuries right yeah and the doctors I remember going back up to Bath my consultation he's like I've never seen anything like this from someone your age he was like can we take this to the world um you know, medical conference to discuss it. And I was like, yeah, no problem. And they did. <laughs> you need to call in an expert from yeah, Lithuania. Yeah, and he sort of came back and was like, you have two <laughs> choices, really. If you carry on lifting, you're going to be in a wheelchair. Um, or you give it a go of rehabbing it and see what happens. Uh, but he was basically saying, you need to stop weightlifting. 
So that was obviously really upset me down. And I guess I had like sort of two weeks of not really knowing what to do. And then Amanda Booth came back to me and said, look, let's, let's give it a go and just try and rehab it and we'll just see what happens. So we went back to working um, on low level core stuff and I'd go see her three times a week for rehab, etc. cetera. And um, at the time after a little while, I started just when I could walk, etc. again and was in very little pain, started snatching just the five kilo bar. Mm-hmm. And again, this is one of the, like, the things that I think, and I mean, Ben Bergeron did a really good talk about injury like a while back and, you know, about when I, in his talk, he's talking about how, it, when his daughter broke her, a tour ACL in a lacrosse thing. And it's like, that really like made me realize back at the same point when this back injury happened to me, it gave me a, point to actually correct things that were wrong in my lifting because though yeah I was a really good lifter there was I was making like little technical mistakes like my knees used to come in when I used to clean I wasn't really strong enough for how good I was technically yeah and the bar used to crash on me etc my arms like little spindles yeah and it gave me time to sort of as I was rehabbing and coming back, I spent a year snatching just 15 kilos. Just working on fundamentals and technique. Technique, ingraining it, which is like why I think now, nearly 10 years on, my technique's really good and really consistent Grease because I had that time to correct those issues earlier on that a lot of people don't because they keep going, keep going, keep going. And then you get... They get a bad injury yeah. and that's it. Yeah. Or you just never be able to progress because those technical patterns are... So there's a, an, an interesting segue there. So I started boxing uh, about three, four years ago. Mm. And it was originally to do a white collar boxing fight against another promoter who's a good mate. And um, I, I loved it. I absolutely, I really, really enjoyed it and decided, I'm, fuck it, I'm going to continue. And went out to Thailand and went to Thailand and did kickboxing and Muay Thai and stuff like that. And I absolutely loved it. What I found was that because I'd spent so long doing bodybuilding, that, I mean, you can hear that little click there. That's my wrist. Yeah. It's, I, I swear that I didn't mean for it to happen at the right time. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Full people to call you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I'm just going to pop it away from the mic or else it makes that... And I get annoyances off the audience. So, I'm boxing. And what I found was that because of the years of doing like chest press and stuff like that, my power of being able to throw punches was super, super high. But because my technique wasn't there, I actually ended up injuring my wrists pain, yeah. so badly. And I'm like, no, this can't be the way. Like, it can't be that I'm too powerful for my own body. I don't even know how to throw a punch properly yet. Yeah. But that was the case. And it sounds like the same for you. You were almost too strong for your own biomechanics. Yeah. Like, you were able to lift weights that your body wasn't well, able it's to just, support. Yeah, I think it was the other way around. Like, technically, like... I was enabled, it was enabling me to lift heavier than my body was actually yes. ready for. But yeah, same principle. Yeah, yeah. Sure. but coming at it from a different side. So you've spent your time snatching 15 kilos. And yeah, came back 2009. So this is had, or well, I can remember doing another Europeans, another juniors. And I was successful in those years up to the point where I finished um, coming up to year five or six and um I think through having done that having having that injury I started to question um I guess bits of what my coach was getting me to do because I was going to competitions internationals and seeing other guys that were far stronger than me lifting differently to me and I was like to my coach why weren't we doing so much deadlifts and pulls and squats Mm. as the other guys Mm. And the coach was like, oh, you don't need that. It's all about, you know, speed and technique. And I was like, getting to the point where I was lifting as much as she was. And I guess I got to the point where I believed that I needed someone who was lifting more weight Mm -hmm. to understand what it takes to lift that weight. And now being in that position, or now, like, you know, 10 years on, I I think it was the right choice that I made. So... Uh, we did have a bit of a disagreement, a bit of a falling out, and it got to year six where you decide sixth form, college, etc. Mm-hmm. And I was still playing golf at this point, and I was playing to a good level. I was playing off like four, three or four handicap alongside my weight of thing. Like, wow. So 
um, I was good. And uh, my dad was obviously really wanting me to crack on with um, golf. My golf. And um, I had to make a decision what I was going to do, basically. So I ended up finding a weightlifting coach in Bristol called Andy Souter. And it was a really well-renowned weightlifting gym. It was the closest to um, Plymouth as we could find home. And one of my friends was going to university there. So I was like, well, I'll move to Bristol and go join this weightlifting gym and off we go. Were you going to go to college as well, like sixth form or whatever? Or were you just going to go to weightlift full time? To weightlift, that that was it. I was doing that. Single-minded. Yeah. And um, I had good GCSEs. I had like six A stars, six A's and four B's, four C's that did all like the triple awards and all the extra ones. So I had good GCSEs. Um, And... So I said to my dad, Dad, I want to move to Bristol to uh, Wait, come wait there. Age 16. And he just looked at me like, you dumb, you're not doing that. <laughs> um, so anyway, I went away for a couple of weeks and I went on the computer, did a bit of research and stuff and um, I ended up finding a golf academy in Bristol. <laughs> so I went back to my dad, I said, Dad, you know what, scrap weightlifting, like, I want to join this golf academy. And he was like, I'm not stupid. But <laughs> oh. He was like, but I'll let you go, but on one condition. So okay, go on. He said, I'll give you £200 a month for six months. And if you don't find your own way in six months, you have to come back home. Mm-hmm. So I was like, fuck. Okay, well, let's give it a go. That's flying the nest. Big style, right? Yeah. So at 16, off I went. Like, I hardly knew how to wipe my own bum. Went to Bristol. And um, my mate was obviously just started uni there. And um, slept on his uni hall floors for the first two months of... Being in Bristol. And as you can imagine, fresh as we went out, got hammered, had my mate's ID, like (laughs) made every mistake you could make as a 16 year old moving out from home and having no responsibilities. Just do what you want. Um, But at the same time, like, great. Had so much fun. I got to the, I managed to get to stay there to the point when um, someone actually dobbed me in for being 16 to the security guard (laughs) for (laughs) reasons that we won't mention right now. Um, and I end up having to find a room then to rent, but obviously living off 200 pounds a month was very difficult. 50 pound a week, like (laughs) food, everything like, and it was tough. And, um, I used to get the bus down from North Bristol down to, um, the center of town to, um, walk to the gym and the gym was in St. Paul's, which is a notoriously like bad area, rough area. It's got like a bad stigma behind it. Okay. And not now, but at the time it did. Um, but the Empire Sports Club were there. And like I said, this was a proper gym. Like this is an old church. And anyone who went to the Empire, it was known everywhere. You train properly. There's a weightlifting in there. There's boxing. We had like world champion boxers coming out of there. Mr. Universes. So ev- everything was done to a high, a high yeah, degree. Yeah, Precious McKenzie trained there. Like the lot. Yeah. Um so if you went there, you were serious. And used to, I get off the bus and I used to walk down to this um, to the gym. And um, I guess it got to my month five of being in Bristol. And uh, having a way out of the time, like, I kind of, you take for granted all of those things that your parents do for you. <laughs> washing up, washing your clothes. Sandwiches and cut, cut the corners. Cut, yeah, yeah, yeah. cut sandwiches, etc. Yeah. And uh, yeah, had to grow up really quickly, I guess. And it was coming up to, I guess now we're looking about a year out from London 2012. Yeah. Was that in the back of your mind? Were you thinking of when course, you first like, started, we, was that the goal? Was it London 2012? I want to compete in my home nation. Of course. That's what I mean. My dream is always to go to the Olympic games. And that was definitely in the back of my mind. And um, even in my coaches that there was a good chance because when you're at Olympics in your home country, you get quota spots. So the qualification isn't like how it is now, where it's, you have to be like top, 10 in the world it's really difficult Mm -hmm. this is like you have um, you have to um, yes you get quota spots this is like you you don't have to be top 10 in the world so you had three spots basically so it's much easier to qualify Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah it was definitely on my compass for sure so um, like I said I used to get the walk down through St Paul's to the gym and I'm in month five of being there and I'm working out how I can try and stay <laughs> in Bristol because I'm two months out from the world championships which was the first uh, one of the last qualifiers for the Olympic Games and I was like I need to stay in Bristol to do this and I uh, walked into the car park one day and like I said I've already described what the Empire was like old church and a mm-hmm. shit old area 
But there's this is brand new white Porsche 911 Turbo S parked in the car park. I'm just like, fuck, like that is. You're brave. Yeah, that is nice car. What the fuck is it doing here? Yeah. And um, I walked into reception and I said um, to my coach, Andy, who was behind the bar, I said, uh, Andy, who's a, whose car's that part in the car park? His, his name's Jeff. He's in the main gym, in the bodybuilding gym. So I thought, all right, fine. And uh, I walked off into the main gym, kicked the door open, and I just shouted, who's Jeff? <laughs> and I re- the rooms that I'd probably say like six times the size of this room, it's yeah. quite a big long hall, and there's l- everyone in there, like I said, is serious Massive. training. And, yeah. and uh, they've all sort of stopped because they've come in and said, who's Jeff? And Jeff's on the other end of the room, <laughs> um, sat there doing bench press, and he sat up and he goes, what do you want? I'm Jeff. <laughs> and I just said, fancy sponsoring me? <laughs> First thing I said to him, like, and uh, he goes, well, um, how much is it going to cost? And like I said, at the time, I was living off £200 a month. Mm-hmm. And um, I was like, he's obviously got a few quid. I need to be here two more months. An extra 100 quid, get some trainers, 500 quid. So 500 quid? And he went, what, a month? And my jaw sort of like hit the floor <laughs> at that point. Bearing in mind, I was living off £200 a month. Yeah. Everyone in the gym probably only just about earned five hundred pound a month, and this guy is going to give it to me, the little kid. So everyone stopped what they're doing. They scrapped their sessions, and they're just watching this conversation just go back and forth now. And I went, um, yeah, "Yeah, okay then." And he just went sound and just led back down the carriage of bench press. What a story! I'm just kind of like, has that really just happened? But okay, yeah. walked out and got on with my session. And then about an hour later, Jeff's come out and he gone there. Uh, yeah, I'll have, what's your bank details? So I give my bank details. And sure enough, the next month, five recruitment in my account. And uh, I ran my dad up and I said, Dad, I'm staying in Bristol. Fuck golf. I'm yeah, exactly. To try and go to you the Throw your baguette down the, bit, down the yeah. drain. And um, I guess after that, me and my dad didn't really speak so much <laughs> for a while. Um, a relationship definitely like sort of went, went apart. You but, think he was predicting that you were going to end up going back home? Um... I don't think so. I think he knew that I was very determined to do what I wanted to do. Um, But because we sort of drifted, and I'll go back and tell you a little bit more about Jeff, because he's kind of a really big part to my success and my story, because from that moment on, um, so I'll go back and tell you about Jeff anyway. So Jeff used to race BMX as a kid, and he was a really good BMX racer. And... um, he was European number two and good enough to go to America to turn pro. Um, but unfortunately, his um, his parents didn't have enough money to send him out to America, so he subsequently ended up quitting and uh, stopping his sport. But off the back of that, he ended up setting up a telecoms company and now is an extremely successful telecoms company. In his own right. In his own right, multi-millionaire. Um, but at the same time, one of the most down-to-earth, nicest, funniest guys you'll ever meet. And he saw me in a similar situation. I had a dream of, you know, going to the Olympics. He was very aware of me and my circumstances. And, you know, because at the club, I was obviously well known um, of what I had dreams of doing. And uh, he saw me in a similar position to him as a young kid, but he was in a position where he could help. Mm. And uh, so he did. A lot of uh, sort of poetic irony, poetic justice in that situation, right? That you happened to come across a guy who, was in such a similar situation to you and then not only was in a similar situation but had the resources to be able to assist yeah, you with I think, that. Yeah, definitely. It's a stroke of, a stroke of luck for sure but the thing that I take away from that and the thing that I try and... Because people go, well, Sonny, like, you managed to get sponsors, no one else did, etc. And it's, it's as simple as if you don't ask, you don't get. And that wasn't the first time I'd asked someone for sponsorship. That was probably about the 150th time after countless letters I'd sent out and just had no replies, etc. It Although, yeah, it's great, but it doesn't necessarily happen the first time. But if you don't have the balls to ask someone, then how are you ever going to know? Do you think that that little situation that you've said there and the, the framework that's around it is a microcosm to a degree for weightlifting, that people see you walk onto the platform they see you snatch 160, 180 kilos. They see you put these lifts up and they go, well, like, of course he can do that. Look at how strong he is. And you go, well, hang on. 
you haven't seen all of the fails that I've done in the gym. You haven't seen all of the hours that I've had to go into it. Of course. And that's, that's the thing about any sport when you're put in the, the limelight and you have to perform for that one moment and no one sees the, the backstory and everything, the sacrifices and stuff that you go through along that journey. The walking on crutches for eight weeks at the age of 14. And the, the, all of that stuff. And I mean, like from that moment on, you know, we, we went on and I actually ended up missing out on the um, London 2012 Olympics by one kilo. It's heartbreaking for me at the by time. one kilo? Yeah, but one, two kilos I missed out on it by. And, you know, it's heartbreaking for me. And again, like you, you learn from that experience and, you know, Jeff went to me, well, you know what? Like, why don't we just carry on with the sponsorship deal and you try and qualify from, um, try and qualify for Glasgow 2014. What's what was that? Is that's that- Commonwealth Games. Yeah. So that's like your next biggest thing, really, in weightlifting to the Olympics. And I guess for me, that moment, that heartbreak, that failure, and the disappointment—I still remember how it felt. That was like my catapult to make sure that for the Commonwealth Games, that wasn't going to be the same thing. I wasn't going to miss out on being there. Um, but it kind of worked both ways for me because I made sure that you know I stepped up my training, etc., and made sure I hit the qualification total when I did and it was great and I went to that competition to take part that's exactly what I did and I had no aspiration for anything more than just to be there Mm. and that was again another big learning curve for me because it made me actually think of the psychological side of how you approach um, competition performance and events and like for me, like like I said, I all I had was the aspiration to be there. I ended up lifting weights that I was capable of um, and finishing in fifth place. And I think, what if I had fucking tried and actually gone into that competition believing that I could win? And if I'd lifted out of my skin, reached PB heights, there probably would have been a good chance that I could have maybe snatched a bronze medal. But because I didn't believe that I was going to do any better than just be there, that's all that happened. Do you think that that was an artefact of not making it to 2012? Um, I, that thought process, I don't. I don't because I'd never been in a position where I was competed in a major championships like that. Um, so, but you, I did, you, did you feel like you'd already accomplished what you wanted to accomplish simply by being there? Yeah, exactly. Okay. And. Yeah. You know, I think whether I lifted five kilo more, five kilo less, it wouldn't have made any difference to me because I just wanted to be there. Yeah. Because becoming, at the time, getting to the Commonwealth Games was a massive thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to sidetrack a little bit here because I think this is another, like, valuable thing that I learned from reflection on that was that, like, at points of my career, the things that I thought were of most importance, now I've got older... I've actually realised that they weren't and like if I could go back and change or change my thinking it it would be that what sort of stuff so for example like I used to hold my body weight down at like 56 kilos or 77 kilos or certain weight categories far longer than I ever should starve myself I used to live off jelly babies and make myself sick so that my body weight wouldn't go up because I had no knowledge of any nutrition in order to break a British under 17 record Mm -hmm. which in the grand scheme of things means absolutely (laughs) fuck all no one remembers who won the youth olympic games 100 meter sprint do they yeah everyone remembers the senior thing but the time as a kid and growing up you think it's the most valuable thing on earth and you do anything to achieve it and just like i did get just getting to the commonwealth games i think what's interesting there is that perspective is something you naturally get as your frame of reference is wider and this is for everything, right? Like your first breakup feels like your world's collapsing. Well, maybe yeah. not for you. But <laughs> I mean, like your first breakup feels like your world's collapsing. But 10 years hence, you're like par for the course, like easy come, easy go, so to speak. And you're totally right. I can remember playing cricket and I got accepted to play for Durham Academy. And for me, like I got to warm up the Australian team when they were playing at Durham against England. Mm. So I got to bowl against Ricky Ponting and like some of the best players on the planet. And I remember thinking like, this is like the pinnacle of like what I can achieve. I'm like, you're not even on the strip. You're like in the nets, you're in the nets in the arse end of the stadium. And, but at the time you've got that, do you know what I mean? You're so, you're so overwhelmed by the experience 
Mm. And, you know, I think for young athletes, any young athletes that are listening, I, I like what you said at the beginning, which was that you you expanded that dom- what your perceived domain of competence to be global. That it was like, okay, I don't just need to be as good as the people in my town or in my region or in my country or even in like my continent. I need to be, if I want to be the best in my sport, I need to be the best, yeah. period. And I think what's interesting is that there's still little artifacts of that that are percolating through. And obviously for someone who has made it to the top of the sport, it's interesting to hear that they are still subject to the same kinds of cognitive biases and uh, and thought processes that a lot of people will. Hmm. They sell themselves short of their own, yeah, of off their own, own talent. Yeah, and off your own expectation. And I mean, going on from that, like I said, that being a, like quite a big point, I guess, in my sport or realisation of myself and actually having like maybe even a thought about the psychological process. Because prior to that, I, did, I think there's no way that sitting with a psychologist and talking about um, scenarios, etc., could ever make me lift any more weights. Well, when, when your nutrition, the zenith of your nutrition is jelly babies. Yeah. Like psychological training is probably not top of no, the list. But as a kid, you, there was no support. I mean, there's very little in weightlifting. And I mean, up to that point, um, the men's team had had very slim amount of funding up to the Commonwealth Games. And afterwards, it stopped. And after the Commonwealth Games, half the team retired. They stopped because there was like, there's no way that I can continue training this hard, etc. And, and like I said, I was training um, six days a week and it would be, three of them would be two, three sessions a day and the other ones would be one, two sessions a day. So, you know, racking up at least like nine to 12 sessions um, a week, you commit your whole life to it. And the, the guys were a little bit older than me and they were like, 24 now, I need to go and get a job, a job and earn money because this isn't paying me anything. And they end up quitting. But for me at that point, it was like, I'm not going to let the fact that I'm not getting any money stop me from wanting to achieve my dream of going to the Olympic Games. And that's, again, like my second, like I'd say, most valuable thing I'd say is like, if there's any obstacles, regardless of whether it's in sport, in life, there's always a way around them or a solution. You've just got to be that, I guess, pig-minded to want to be able to go and solve it. And a lot of people give up that really quickly. I think this is like we're going back to saying about traits of a good sportsman or a good athlete. They don't give up that easy. They isn't go it, and find a solution to the Isn't to the it box. strange that stubbornness is a virtue sometimes? Yeah, of course. Yeah, <laughs> like, of course. But like, yeah, great in a sporting, sporting situation, in a relationship. Probably bad in a relationship. Yeah, yeah so absolutely. Swings absolutely. and roundabouts. Um, so yeah, come off games is gone. Um and now we're two years out from the Olympic Games and obviously um, that was well and truly then my next biggest focus and don't, the whole way through this like I said Jeff's still there supporting me with various bits and bobs and it got to the point where I was about 15 kilos off after the Commonwealth Games what I would need to do in order to qualify for the Olympic Games and the last two years prior to that I'd probably put like maybe four or five kilos on my total each year. It's a very small amount. Yeah, tiny amount. Um, So it was going to be difficult to sort of reach that. And I had to look at things. And like I said, my training was bang on. I was working super hard in the gym. All of that was good. But I had to look at things outside of just what I did in the gym that could potentially help me with my performance. And that's when I started to look at nutrition, start look at um, psychology, start looking my lifestyle, sleep, lifestyle, recovery, all of these other aspects. And what I like to see it as like a spider's web um, of my life and that could potentially contribute to uh, my performance. And um, I looked at, um, I guess we'll talk firstly about psychology because we're kind of on that. And um, like I said, as a kid, I had no belief at, the, at all that some guy could help me actually put improve. Mm-hmm. But I started working with this psychologist, one, my friend's dad, Martin Fricker, and two, David Riedel. Um, and they're both of the same school as sort of the Steve and Steve Peters, is it? Chimp Paradox, etc. And um, 
I guess the key things that I'm going to extract that they that helped me with my lifting, one was developing a process um, for when I'm lifting. So a routine that I go through every single time before I lift in order to develop consistency and also to be able to carry over any performance that I did in training into an environment like a major championships. Because commonly you see athletes that can do bang and bang in the gym, put them on a platform and go, do something different or lose their rhythm and don't actually deliver on the day. So they taught me to help and develop a process. Um, and the second thing was only like worrying about the things that I could control. Like, so again, like outcomes weren't, they're just byproducts of whatever the process was. So um, I guess those two things without going into too much depth really helped me. Can you, can you explain what your process is? Yeah. Before you do a lift. Okay. Yeah. And this is something that's really independent to everyone. And I think the sooner you become aware of your individual process, the better chance you've got then of obviously being consistent. So for me, I pace up and down the bar, backwards and forth. I stand back behind the bar and I, what I like to call my think box. So this is where I'm thinking about the two, the technical side of things that my coach has taught me, whether it's to stay over, keep the bar close, etc my technical cues there and I visualize myself. Um, this is always a good question because people always ask this. Do you visualize watching myself or in my own body? Yeah. Yeah. So I visualize watching myself do it and, um, executing the lift and it being a great lift. And, um, yeah. So after that, then, um, I approach the bar and that's when my, like, that's my trigger then to just go through my routine. So my routine is always right hand first then left hand and then I set my feet I shake my arms I get my breathing controlled and then I set my I start counting then three five four three two one matter it very quietly under my breath when I hit one I lock in and go and for me like because I always used to have that issue which a load of probably the listeners will as well and anyone does weight of thing um right before you come off the floor you think fuck this is going to be heavy <laughs> or yeah well you laugh because you know exactly what I'm going on about and that doesn't change whether you're an Olympic athlete or it's your first day yeah. you go fuck this is going to be heavy or I might hurt myself here but again the negative outcomes like of whatever your process is and for me just by counting down before I lift and going like one like a gunshot at a race it distracts your mind from thinking about those negative thoughts. So that worked really well for me. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, and really that's happy. the same for both snatch and clean and jerk. Yeah. Okay. And what about, cause I've always, I've always wondered this once you count to one and once the movement has begun, do you just let the training kick in in the same way as a boxer doesn't think too much, but there must be a point in snatch. I can see that it's one more fluid movement. Yeah. There must be a moment once you've cleaned the bar and then you stand you up. You did the exact same thing, but a shorter version of it. So okay. I get out the top of my clean. My foot comes in, feel the weight of my heels. Three, two, one, bang, go, jerk. So it's exactly the same thing, broken into two. That's awesome. Yeah. That's a lovely little framework for people to use. And it sounds so stupid that I've stepped up to the bar, like in workouts or even like going for max lifts. And I've just like a- approached the bar, like, gripped it hoped mm-hmm. for the best but I don't have a I don't have a process no. and that's why you won't get consistency yeah again to draw this back I feel like I'm talking about a sport I haven't played for nearly 10 years now cricket an awful lot today but it's the best analogies that I can find and for that you can imagine as a bowler runs in so you've got a bowler who's running in from the back of his run up especially if it's a fast bowler you've got five seconds from when this guy sets off until like when he hits the crease mm. and releases the ball and during that time a lot uh, you've got an awful lot of time to think and you like you end up getting trapped within your own thoughts Mm. and that's the last thing that you want especially when you're talking about someone who's pitching a ball 80 85 miles an hour if you think you you don't have time to react you need to Mm. allow whatever your movement is to just carry through and just have the the essences of where the fielders are positioned how you know he typically bowls what the what the pitch is going to be like all of the little things that come through you need to still have those in your mind, but not consciously. But it's this, this interesting that you, you you draw the comparison because you have to remember in weightlifting, like, sorry, in, in cricket, in football, your action is a reaction of something else. Whereas obviously in weightlifting, 
You, it's not the same. Total controllable. Yeah, the total control. So you initiate the movement when you want to, and it's there's definitely a difference there in terms of you having that split second to make a decision. Yeah. Whereas like for weightlifting, you're just executing that process. The same as in a in a golf swing, and that's what I love about um, individual sport and like being like. I guess the only one there and spotlight on you because at the end of the day it's down to you then as to whether it's a good lift a bad lift or the execution and you know you can have a great performance one day and you know okay there's other people involved like support teams etc but it's down to you and if you have a shit there you know it's it's uh, it. it's strange it's both it's both liberating and terrifying to think that if you've lifted, if you've snatched 180 kilos before in the gym, you can snatch 180 kilos on the platform. There's no reason why you can't, which puts the power firmly in your hands. But it also means that the failure's in your hands as well. Mm. And I think that it must be for the guys that are at the top level of the sport and the same for CrossFit. Like, especially with when you look at stuff like regionals, mm. um, they release the regionals events in advance. The athletes will have tested the events at home. They know exactly how fast they can go. They may have even done a practice weekend where they've gone, okay, we're going to go back to back to back. This is the timings. This is the... But this is quite easy for me to, to answer that that thing because this is the thing that people don't really take notice of when you talk about someone's performance in competition versus their performance in training. When you're in training, you've slept in your own bed the night before. You've woken up and eaten out your same cereal bowl you're used to eating from with your same cereal. You're lifting with your favourite bar, with your favourite plates on your favourite platform. And you've got your favourite coach there with you watching you train. And that is your ideal environment to perform. And that's why I don't think, I think everyone's different in terms of like, you know, what competition can bring out of you. You know, some people do their best in competition, but there's, I don't think it's necessarily, um, a surprise that people sometimes perform best in their own environment. Because when you travel to say Berlin, sleep in a hotel, maybe get woken up by the cars that you're not used to go down to breakfast and there's shit food there, etc. cetera. Um, regardless of whether you've done the workout or not before, you're not in your best environment to perform. And it's only the real top athletes that can rep- replicate as much of what happens at home in the comp when they travel for competition mm-hmm. that really perform. So you go back to controllables and uncontrollables to a degree that you said is the second part of, of your mental strategy. And you're totally right that I've said it must feel terrifying and liberating in the same degree. But as you say, if you take everything back to the process and you grease the groove and you have a plan and you stick to the plan and the plan is, I, I know that I perform best when I eat these kinds of foods, pack them in your bag. Like, yeah. I know that I need to have silence when I go to a hotel room, pack some earplugs. Exactly. Like, well, those this are is, controllables. Yeah, and this is the the follow-on from this story is going to be quite funny for you now. So um, I've identified all these things, what I need for competition, etc., my best stuff, etc., um, down to my nutrition, start working with a nutrition company and have my food prepped, etc. And there's good bits and bad bits of that, but carrying on from what we're actually discussing. So I know what I need to perform, my weightlifting suit, etc., my boots, prep everything. So whenever I go to a competition, it's all there, exactly how I had it, practiced it in training. Yeah. And six months before the qualifiers now for Rio 2016, I've gone away and done all it, sorted out my nutrition, sorted out my sleep recovery. I lived like a Mormon for... Six months, did went to bed at the same time every single day for six months, ate the same thing every single day for six months, didn't have a drop of alcohol, didn't socialise. Like, it's a very monastic lifestyle. Yeah, turn like turn myself into a robot. Turn myself into a robot for the six months. Are, the, are these the sort of sacrifices and beyond that that you need to make to of, get to that Of level? course. I, and you, I mean, even going back into childhood, I can count on one hand how many times I spent kicking a football round in the playground. <laughs> I can count on, like, all our hands, how many holidays I missed out on, parties I didn't go to, because, like, for me, there was much more bigger things. At, like, the age of 16, okay, maybe I hadn't, like, tried a drug and, like, 
done all the things that you know those 16 year old but i traveled to like maybe like majority of the continents of the world and seen like 15 places which are like 16 years old not many people get the opportunity to do and that was for me more important than those things so it swings and roundabouts i wouldn't say like you're hard done by but there's other things you know i think what you're doing is you are you've chosen your values at an early age which not a lot of young people can do you've decided what is of value to you and what virtue and integrity with that value percolating through looks like and you've gone, okay, I'm going to get after it. Mm. Like, I'm not going to allow um, social norms or what I should be doing at this particular age to dictate how I, oh, yeah, exactly. how, I how I need to behave. Exactly. And again, we come back to the stubbornness and the pig-headedness and kind of the, the um, desire to chase what you feel is your own, your own path. And it, in this sense, yeah, it's absolutely a virtue. Mm. You know, it can be... A nightmare for a parent trying to bring a child up who's got this sense of uh, like direction and idea because they're not going to compromise and it can be yeah. a, you know a nightmare in a relationship it can be uh, there's a whole host it swings and roundabouts again but you know if you want to be a good athlete and you don't compromise on things like it's probably a pretty fucking good foundation to start yeah so going back to like what I was saying like so the six uh, the six months have gone it's now competition day of the qualifiers for the Rio 2016 Olympics, like my my day of reckoning, D Day, whatever you want to call it. Now I'd had special weightlifting shoes done that were black and gold that made. I'd had special Nike weightlifting suit that was black and gold. I had like a Nike track suit that had like my special logo stitched into it. Brand new pants, brand new socks, like everything snap back black and gold. Like you sound like a baller. Yeah, I was like, but this is exactly how I'd been envisaging it for yeah. months. This is my day and this is how it's going to go. So yeah. all of this prepped and ready to rumble. Mm-hmm. And um, anyway, Jeff's come pick me up in his car, just like we planned, and we're driving up to the competition. And um, Where's the competition? It's in Coventry. And um, we're about an hour away, I guess, from the venue now. And um, I'm watching the competition on the live stream, like, just mm-hmm. seeing how my friends and people were getting on. And um, the guy thought, the guys walked out and I thought, oh, he's got a similar weightlifting suit to me. And it was just as I had that thought, I went, no. And I was at Jeff, pull the car over, mate. I need to check my kit bag. Went in the back of the car. Bearing in mind, I've done 60, 70 competitions plus, big major competitions at this point. I left my weightlifting shoes and my weightlifting suit at home to the biggest day of my life, to something I've thought about every single day for six months. And I was like, fuck. Like, we were too far away because we would have missed way in to go back. Mm-hmm. Had to end up getting Jeff's wife to bring up one of his old weightlifting suits. And my coach just so happened to have one of my old pairs of weightlifting shoes in his car. So going from, like, the most prepped I'd ever been mm-hmm. to exactly how this day was going to go to all of a sudden, like, spanner in the works, like, my suit's not there. But do you know what? And this is why, like, when people ask me, do, are you stereotypical about anything now or in competition? I'm not. Because for me, I learned from that day that it, regardless of what happens, if you prepared well enough for something, like, you could have stuck me in a pink tutu that day and I would have still lifted the same because I was that prepared for the competition. So I've rocked up, dusted these boots off, got my suit on, weighed in, and the competition had began. Now, it was a, there's a really good clip on YouTube um, of the... Dean will make sure that the link is here. Or here. Of the, actual, um, of the actual fight for the qualification between me and um, another weightlifter called Owen Boxall. Really good lifter. So and, you must have um, known going in that it was going to be between you two for this? Well, for my weight category, definitely. And then my best friend who was in a lightweight category, Gareth Evans, was also in the mix. But it's done, it was done on like points. And, um, but I knew I had to be Owen, like minimum requirement. And um, notoriously, when me and Owen have competed, it's been very like back and forth as to like I win, he win, etc. He always used to snatch more than me. Mm-hmm. Um, but I used to always clean jerk more than him, so... The snatch comes first, right? Yeah. Um, so, anyway, we've gone on to... Um, gone on through the snatch, and I've ended up um, beating Owen by, like, 
a, quite a few, I think it was like two kilos in the snatch, which is like unheard of. And I was like, boy, this great start, perfect snatch at 153, I think. And um, I was like, that's it, I've done this pretty much. And uh, Owen's opener was like 175. My opener was like 185. And I was thinking like one, like, I easily open on 185. So I thought I'm like 10K on the openers. And his opener's gone up. Fair play. And then he's come out on like 182, which is like his PB. I thought, poor. What, for his like, second like, lift? No, for his first lift. I thought, fair play, he's going for it. And he came out and he did it. Fair play, mate. Like, I come out, did my 185, and put like four kilos ahead now. Mm-hmm. And then he's gone like 180. Nine, <laughs> and I'm, I was going one night anyway, so I thought, yeah, no problem, whatever. Yeah, and um, he's come out and done one eight nine, so he's like ahead now again on body weight. I think bastard, like. <laughs> shit the bed. So now I'm my second lift, and I've hit one ninety, and I thought, poor, that's it now. There's no way like he's got <laughs> another lift in him, and sure enough, he comes out one nine three and makes it. He's made a twelve kilo PB on his final lift, <laughs> and he's. Like, for some reason, the way the numbers were, I thought that didn't matter that he got one nine through. I thought I was still in the lead. Yeah. And like, I'm in the back, like, chilling like this. I don't even need to do my last lift of one. <laughs> and my coach comes out and he goes, so you need to make this lift. You need one nine three. And I was like, no, nah, no, nah, put one nine four on. It's fine. Mm-hmm. And he's like, you only need one nine three. Put one nine four on, no problem. And I put my hat on and I've spun my hat back round. So I'd taken my hat off because I always lift my snap back. Mm-hmm. Put it back on and off I went out. Like nothing had phased me. And like everyone is like on the edge of their seats. Like, and it was for like a British record. And I've come out and I've cleaned the weight, one nine four. As I'm standing out of it, I threw up in my mouth. Why? Swallowed, I don't know, just swallowed it down and then just nailed the jerk. And it was like, that was the only way that day was going to go, like, regardless of the scenario. And this is what I say, like, when you prepare for something that well, it, it didn't matter. That was the outcome for me for that day. And wrong kit, wrong shoes. Didn't matter. All of the worry before, all the anxiety before, thrown up in your mouth. Yeah. Some guys lifted his 12 kilo PB, yeah. but because you've greased the groove that hard and yeah. because you've done the work, you're able to trust the process. Yeah. And the outcome's almost inevitable. Mm. And uh, yeah, and then that was me on my on my way to Rio. Get on your fucking way to Rio. Yeah, that's amazing. Were you allowed to lift in a snapback? I was the first person to start doing it, and because I saw you, I'll explain my reasoning for doing it. Because initially, when I started doing it, a lot of the weightlifting community were like, "That's really bad. You shouldn't do that. It's disrespectful." But Mm. for me, you watch weightlifting. A guy walks out. He lifts his weight. Mm. makes some sort of celebration sometimes, it walks back out the back. You get no understanding or connection to that person as an athlete, as a performer. It's going back to like we say, you don't see all that stuff that goes back. Mm. Whereas like, I love what I do and I want to show a little bit of my personality, a little bit of my charisma when I'm lifting. So like yeah. a signature. Yeah, so this is me. This is me snap back a bit of... Me, and instantly when you see that, you get like a little ink oh, thing. That's the, guy that, that's the guy that wears the snapback. About that person, just for seeing the red snapback. Yeah. And that was my reasoning for doing it. And yeah, it made me feel comfortable when I did it. And I didn't care that people didn't like the fact that I wore it. Mm. It was me and, you know... It's cool that, um, it's cool that it, it, it's allowed in the... It's counted as part of your body. So if the bar was to touch it or if it was to fall off, it'd be a no lift. Okay. But yeah... It is what it is. And like nowadays you'll see, there used to only ever be like, when I started one type of weightlifting shoe, they'd be the same color. Mm. There'd be one weightlifting suit. So everyone's in the same suit, the same shoes coming out, lifting a bar, the same boring as shit. Yeah. <laughs> it's different now because of CrossFit. Yeah. There is like multiple different weightlifting suits, multiple different shoes. So if you do have any sort of inkling of fashion sense, you could put together something that almost looks like a planned outfit. Yeah. So it's different and maybe, but like, yeah, that was, that was my reasoning for doing it. That's cool. I think it's really, uh, it's really interesting. I've got for the listeners at home, Johnny, who is a national level power lifter was making me laugh the other day as he said that he couldn't believe in powerlifting that when you deadlift, your socks aren't allowed to touch your knee sleeves. If your socks touch your knee sleeves, 
That used to be a rule in weightlifting. Three red, right? three red lights. And yeah, it's changed now. Yusuf once got three red lights on a lift for putting his one foot on the platform, like on the corner of the platform, basically off camera, before his clock had started. Like just mm. had his foot, you know, like resting your foot. Had but his there's foot. all those sorts of rules in weightlifting as well that, okay. you, would, that you wouldn't know but about. for some, like somehow having a hat has like... Yes, subverted that, well, that the reason thing. yeah how it does is because they changed the rules only a few years back so that Muslims could female Muslims could compete in weightlifting ah uh, so they can wear the is it the hijab yeah so that they could wear that so that they had to class then any headwear as part of the body which is then how <laughs> wearing a snapback give, give me the snapback <laughs> I'm taking this a little bit but that's how wearing a snapback is it's, yeah, you're allowed to. That's funny. So roll it forward to Rio. Yeah, wow. So I guess going there, like going back and talking about kicking out, I guess, because for me as a kid, like as a athlete representing your country, getting your kit is like one of the proudest moments ever. And um, it is one hell of an experience. Like, I'd, always, I'd heard stories about people that had been to the Olympics um, about what kicking out is like. And... Um, I was like, like kid in a candy store basically. I've been to the Commonwealth one, but it's never the same as like what the Olympics are. Cause they absolutely go nuts for the <laughs> Olympics. Like, so you go into this big court as the NEC and uh, you have a personal shopper and you go through like different sections. So you start off with like formal wear and you've had like this suit made for you with like, you know, um, the Olympic crest on, etc. And every detail of it has got like really individual to you. And we wore that when we met, like, um, Princess Anne and any royalty, you wore your suit. You get these cool shoes, and then you go into, like, village wear. And then this is stuff that you wear around the village. I mean, it's stacks and stacks of stuff. Like, <laughs> um, so you've, you get, like, wet weather gear for, like, Rio. And it, we did actually need it in the end. But, like... Um, Just senseless but amounts any of stuff. possible scenario. And then you go into, like... Um, training wear yeah. and then footwear what were you then, most excited about um whoa. probably the trainers of the footwear like it was all like the the weird sort of thing there's a few jumpers and stuff that i'd seen um i can't remember what i'd say my but the certain top was my favorite piece that we got but um you, you get so much stuff and yeah, you get your accessories. But then the final bit is quite personal because you imagine like, I was the only male weightlifter going and there was one other female going. So when it comes to making what they, what you perform in, they're essentially making you an outfit for your biggest day of your life. And it's just you that's going to have that. Mm-hmm. So obviously for a weightlifter, you're weightlifting suit and you go into this waiting room for a minute and they um, have like a, um, a mannequin <laughs> of... You know, just normal. Is it your, is it your dimensions? Obvious. Because you are not, you are not the shape. traditional no, dimensions they have of a person. Man- yeah, so they have a mannequin of a human, and it's like a big reveal. You walk through, and there's your lifting suit on. A like mannequin, when you get a new right? car, and they pull the yeah, the drape oh, and back. they've made it just for you, and they're so proud of it because obviously they've done it from scratch to be like for you, and it mm-hmm. it was really cool. And you do like some photos and stuff, and then you go through because Audi sponsored it. Mm-hmm. So then uh, you take all of your stuff onto the, the bags, the suitcases. I've got like six bags, like different suitcases and bags, and all of this stuff. And um, that was very special. And um, that's when I guess it starts to feel real that you're going you kick in big style. Then yeah, and then um, the next thing was the holding camp in. Um, Better Horizonte. And bearing in mind, like I said, as a weightlifter, you have, like, no... No one really cares about weightlifting. It's not <laughs> a very popular, famous sport. Um, there's very little funding for it, etc. And all of a sudden, you're flown out to this purpose-built place or, like, fitted-out place for Team GB's preparation for the Olympics. And we get to the airport, and it's like, get on this bus, just three of us three of us, two weightlifters and a coach on this bus. And it's like an eight police motorcycle escort through Bella Horizonte, shutting roads for us as we're going through. Like we're celebrities are like really Fucking important. Donald Trump's just arrived yeah. in. <laughs> yeah, like that. yeah. And that was like weird because like I said, all of a sudden we're now just as important as the sprinters or the boxers and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And you get to this hotel, nice hotel. Again, normally we'd get put in the shittest hotel you could find. <laughs> 
And you've basically got these people there that are there for you for whatever, anything you could possibly think or want. There's a physio full time, there's a doctor, there's recovery people, nutritionists, sleep helpers, and all sorts of stuff. And they'll get you whatever you could possibly want. And it's really weird because, like I said, that, and I was always told that don't do anything that you don't do at home. So obviously, I'd never had any of that at home. So, like, you kind of just don't make them, don't use it. You do what you used to and eat what you used to and stuff. But yeah, cocoa pups, please. Yeah, exactly. Like, they're coming over with like caviar. Yeah. Bottle I'm, of cocoa I'm, pups. I'm all right. Yeah. Just to interject there, do you think that there is a, it definitely sounds like there's a disparity between the level of support that's given to you at anywhere which isn't the Olympics mm. and then at the Olympics there's like this Pareto distribution of like nothing yeah. nothing nothing bang everything yeah. and it's overwhelming and it's like going back to what you said about it being like in competition scenarios it's all of these things it's all of a sudden overwhelming like you go to training while we were there and they've got 15 cameras pointing at you it's flashing while you're training mm. I was like this is like did you want to be back in the church no, I was kind of loving it a bit. Like, you know what I mean? That's it's like, awesome. this was sick. So you like, could embrace it and take yeah. it as your power, right? Yeah, well, it was nice to feel like important that people wanted to come and have photos of you and like interview you and stuff like that. And it was. Do you think that incredible. says a lot about your personality that you almost took energy from that? Yeah, definitely. I wouldn't have said that necessarily energy that would have caused me to compete or perform any better, but I'd say it made me feel special and you know proud of what I'd achieved um, but at the same time very draining like, and the point from the qualifiers to that to the actual Olympic Games was very small in weight it was a six week window and this is the thing with our sport I went balls to the wall to qualify that there's no way no matter who you are can you hold that level of performance for six weeks mm-hmm. without your body falling apart you have to taper and I tried to hold that standard of lifting there up to like what I did the qualifiers, but it's just no chance. I was in, I was on more sleeping tablets, painkillers, everything you could imagine just to be able to lift. And we've flown down to the village now about two weeks out from uh, lifting. And I just said to myself, we went in the village, I said, I don't, regardless of what happens on the day, you've got to remember this experience and that day. Like, as the best day of your life because you're never going to get that opportunity again and that regardless of whether you go to the Olympics again that one day you got to live with that for the rest of your life so I want to make sure I enjoyed it so I just said that to myself and I kind of like took a little bit of pressure off myself in terms of what my training and stuff was going like um, and then we went um, into the village and it's like you hear the stories about the Olympic village yeah and, damn right this yeah. is what everyone's tuned in for yeah but it's like <laughs> it's not like that well, either, either that or it wasn't I missed out were well, you I, in the wrong <laughs> you were in the wrong area right no like, I don't think I was but it just like it didn't seem like that about what everyone sort of in, <laughs> imagined so we went on to um, got into the village and obviously that like, I was just the only weightlifter, male weightlifter. Mm-hmm. But like everyone else is like a team of hockey players, a team of sevens, a team of like athletics. And it's just the weightlifter and like standard, like the weightlifters are just like... <laughs> Put in the corner. Yeah, because I'm well, not winning any medals. So. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they were like, right, do you want to go and share a room in with the ping, pool, uh, uh, ping pong, <laughs> I shouldn't say that, <laughs> table tennis guys, or you can share with the gymnast lads. And I was like, oh, I know a couple of the gymnast lads from the Commonwealth. I'll stay with them. They go, that's fine. You'll have your own room, but you're in the cleanest, like, cupboard. (laughs) (laughs) Fine. (laughs) My room was probably about this big. It was absolutely fine. I walk in and Max Whitlock is in there doing his stretches on the floor. Like, um, he comes straight up. He's like, how you doing? Took a bag in my room. And um, we all just, like, click just like that. So it was me... Max Whitlock, Nar Wilson, Brim Bevan, Christian Thomas, Lewis Smith, um, and Nathan Hall. Mm-hmm. And um, Niles just rang you there, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we're all like um, seven lads in an apartment, <laughs> young lads. There's pranks going on. There's super gluing toothbrushes down to tops and <laughs> all sorts of horrendous stuff, like because just seven lads in an apartment. And they really made me feel like one of 
their team like straight yeah. away like I'd have team meetings with them like I would go for breakfast with them for dinner with them that was really nice that like, to kind of like gain some routine mm-hmm. but definitely for the first week I was around the village like a fangirl like you so many celebrities everywhere you looked and you're like fuck photo selfie like just these people that you're like you've only ever seen them on TV and then all of a sudden they're there eating Cocoa Pops like yeah um so I was like, wow, basically for the first couple of weeks, took a lot of selfies, met lots <laughs> of famous people. And then who was, got, your, who was your favorite person you got a selfie with? Um, I got, I got lots, but I'd say for the reason, I like, wasn't the most famous, but for me as a kid, obviously growing up playing golf, um, Justin Rose was like a bit of a hero. And, um, we're sat in the queue waiting to get on the bus to go to the opening ceremony. And that's like the big thing, the opening ceremony. Like, cause I'd sat as a kid since even way before then and watched the opening ceremony on TV. And then all of a sudden I was in my opening ceremony gear on my way to go to it myself. And I was just got, about to get on the bus and I've seen Justin Rose stood there and I've kind of gone, I've got to go out over and ask him for a photo. Like, and I've gone over and asked him for a photo. He's like, yeah, no problem. We had a photo. And then, he just start, started chatting to me. He was like, so what sport do you do? Blah, blah, blah. We ended up getting on the bus together then and sat together for like 45 minutes on the bus. You're just pinching yourself the whole yeah, time. Yeah, and but like at the same time having the most normal conversation like we are. And um, then he his, his missus FaceTimes and he's like, oh yeah, I'm just sat here with Sonny. He's a weightlifter. Like, and I'm like, hey, Dustin Rose is missing. <laughs> like, this is weird. Um, and then we, we get off the bus then we're starting to walk in you get like walked around like the houses basically before you parade in because it's all done in country order yeah and um, he started like telling stories then about like um, being on the tour and Tiger Woods and like how they've got houses next to each other in Barbados and all these various stories like golf related stuff and cool just shit. like wow wow yeah, like, just lapping it up yeah and like Andy Murray's there as well like and a couple of the other tennis guys and um, all of a sudden we're there and we're just about to walk in. And I had my phone out like that to like, try and video or take a photo. And I was just like, no, there's no way that you could capture what that experience felt like in in any sort of picture. And they, like, you know, that is one of the most specialist moments ever for me, like in my life, walking out to that stadium, the size of it, everyone's looking at you. And I managed to get like right on the front row, right next to Andy Murray. So like, all the photos, <laughs> Andy Murray's there with his massive flag, and then I'm there with my, my little paper. <laughs> and it's Do so you think funny. that that's symbolic? The size of your flag and the size of Andy <laughs> yeah. Murray's flag. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Um, but anyway, so yeah, amazing experience. Like, and you, afterwards, you're like almost like sat up, like. I was going to say, how long did it Buzzing. take to get to sleep after oh, you've been to these yeah, days? Yeah, I didn't think I did, but <laughs> after that, like, um, incredible experience. That, um, and then you're kind of, like, getting towards um, opening uh, competition day. Like, I did various acquaintances, like, meetings with other athletes then, and I will come back on to Andy Murray because, obviously, he got asked to be the flag bearer. And... Um, I guess in the media, Andy Murray comes across like, you know, very emotionless, quite a lot. Some, some would say stoic, right? Yeah. yeah. And, um, he's not like that at all. Like, and I was very fortunate to spend, like sit down and have lunch with him one day when we were at the school and meet him there. Cause we had like a school outside the, to go and train. And I got to spend a bit more time listening to him talk and chat. And once he started to talk and, you know, you got to listen to him more. Actually, like, in my opinion, he's just like a little bit socially awkward and he's by no means like arrogant or, you know, he's just a little bit shy. And like, I think with all of like the, you know, fame and everything he's had, he d- doesn't find it is easiest to express his emotions. And that was really like, I guess, humbling to see that someone that's that successful and has achieved that much is still like almost a little bit shy. Is it, from do you feel quite endeared to him now? Yeah, definitely, definitely from that experience. And the same with, you know, Justin Rose, like, and him giving me that the time of his day, like knowing like how much you know, I looked up to him as a kid mm-hmm. to spend time with him and on a level. And the same with Greg Rutherford, 
mm-hmm. and like triple jumper, right? triple jumper, Olympic gold medalist, won everything. Mm-hmm. And like I'd be sat down for having food, and two days later, Greg would come up and be like, "Hey, I was training Sunny, you good?" And it's like, and still now, like Greg like watches my Instagram story like every day, and we chat regularly. And it's like these guys are like superstars, but it makes you realise that they're no different from anyone else. They're like exactly the same as me and you. They've just had a ridiculously <laughs> huge dedication to yeah. whatever they've wanted to achieve. And I, th- I think it's an interesting point there that you talk about to do with the way that the me- that uh, athletes are portrayed in the media. Like you can, through hard work and dedication and natural talent and all the rest of it, become really, really good within a particular discipline. That has no bearing on your capacity to talk to a camera no, at all. Not. And I think that in this day and age where social media is a transparent window into people's lives and there's such an interest in athletes' private lives, you know, uh, some footballer signs for a different football club, the story gets 10,000 retweets. Some footballer cheats on his wife with another wife, it gets 50,000 retweets. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's almost like... Yeah. everything's become reality TV showized now mm. and people want a narrative that's constantly going on. And you're totally right with the Andy Murray thing. Although I've heard the, you know, that rhetoric like Andy Murray, like miserable Scottish guy. And you think, well, hang on a second. Like, is he? Yeah. Or what happens if you are not someone who's super comfortable on camera? Yeah. How does that make you come across? Oh, actually, it makes you come across exactly the way that he's coming across. Yeah, exactly. This person has decided, to, uh, chosen to be good at their craft and now has had all of these other demands put on them. And you're like, well, fuck. Like, that, is that fair? Yeah. Like, that it, and now you're judging him. You're, ju- well. you're judging him not based on his performance. Like, he's doing good at his performance <laughs> thing. Like, leave him alone. Yeah. And, yeah, I, I think people want the whole package now, right? Mm. Like, and especially, I guess, sponsorship money and all the rest of it. People buy into the character as much as they do the performance. Mm. But then this is when people go back to me and it's commonly asked questions to sports people. What's, who's your biggest inspiration? Who's like your idol? And for me, having been through that experience at the Olympics, it's not about now an individual or an individual person. It's traits of people that have been inspiring and it's like I said that the way in which you know some of the most successful people in the world are so like humble that for me is an inspirational trait and I find that through more now than a specific performance that anyone's done yeah. inspiring it's interesting we were walking into the gym earlier on and there's a guy who you won't know but Nathan Moffat he'll be listening and Nathan was walking out and he's been in Newcastle he was in Newcastle for years he's moved to Australia and his goal is to make it to regionals I think within the next couple of years and he walked out, recognised me, said hi to me, turned around, recognised you, shook your hand, and bef- he walked away and then turned back and said, oh, you helped me with my clean over Instagram DMs like a few mm-hmm. months ago. Thanks for that. And you're like, oh, yeah, man, like, no, cheers, no no problem. You know, like one, just one guy. And yeah. I'm aware that, you know, it's not meeting Andy Murray in the Olympic Village, but to the yeah. same extent, it's the same core message, right? And this is, is, it's exactly that. You've like, hit the nail on the head. And this is where like through for me now, when people do send me direct messages, when people do ask for a photo and it's like, it's still weird for like someone in weight, like me getting like that sort of tension. But I do do my hardest to like, you know, even respond if it's a, the smallest little thing. Cause I remember what it felt like having, you know, Justin Rose be like that with me and think that, you know, if I can do that small thing by, you know, offering someone a couple of words of motivation or advice or liking their video and then be jumping up and down for the rest of the day, it costs me nothing. Mm -hmm. But you then are passing that same sort of message on in terms of what you aspire to be like. And that's not to say I've replied to every single message I've ever been sent because it's just not realistic. But as much as I can, I always do try to, to do that. And it's purely from, you know, having experienced that myself good role models to a degree of people who have made it to the top of the sport. Of course, yeah. So what was it like stepping onto the platform then in Rio? Yeah, wow, well, like, again, it gives me goosebumps now just <laughs> thinking about the actual... So the tell, me, tell, me, tell me what it looks like. Um, so first off, actually, I want to find out, and I'm sure that some of the people will be interested at home. Um, anyone who follows uh, ATG, 
um, or what's the other one? Hook Grip. Gym, Hook Grip, yeah. Yeah, so both of them, amazing Instagram accounts, you should follow them. They do a lot of backstage stuff, right, at big competitions, and they'll track. If you go on the YouTube channel, they go, like, dick and balls. They'll go from, like, empty bar to final to warm-up yeah. lift, and they'll track everything, yeah. and they'll pop it up. Um, so talk me through your routine. You pack your bags, you've arrived at the lifting hall. What happens? Um, yeah, so... It does really seem like a little bit of a a blur now thinking back, like because that day for me, right from start to finish, I've never felt that way on a competition day. I think because like you know, like and it's again, it, it sounds weird because we're talking about um, just another competition, but you've dedicated. You've, we've talked about my whole life today, so you're, and, you're eleven years deep. At yeah, this point. but all of that, all the things that we've talked about, has funneled to that one moment and <laughs> it's really hard to kind of encapture how that feels and I never felt emotional in a competition experience before like that and it was kind of like really hard to kind of you know keep your focus like you would never at any other competition in terms of like your routine your warm-up and stuff because it was like I want to remember this and enjoy it and so- take soak everything in because it's it's such a special day to me and like I know in myself everything that I've sacrificed for that one moment and I remember as you go in you get weighed in and then you sit in like a what room, did you what category were you in 94 kilo class B group okay um, and you there's a room out the back that has like loads of drinks and food and stuff and I had my food and went to put my weightlifting suit and um, again which is like quite special on peeling your suit I pull mine on it, just rips in half, right? My fucking hands, like. <laughs> but luckily, I bought a second one. Pff, second one's on fine, like, so I rip my suit in half. <laughs> um, and you go into the warm up room, and like, you get given your platform, and we had a few photos and stuff. And like, I had this grin on my face that, like, I just couldn't get rid of. Like, I was just so <laughs> Fuck off. fucking yeah. happy. I, like, my cheeks hurt by like the mo- from the moment I woke up till like. That whole day, that's that smile and grin just did not leave my face. And um, we've got to um, now you're obviously in the warm up room, and then you get called for presentation, which is kind of like, right, this is it, like competition's about to start. And I remember coming out, walking out, and them saying Sunny Webster, Great Britain, and like I, it was so hard not to cry, like, and. I still remember it now, like thinking, like, don't cry. This is like, <laughs> this is mate, like so, really uncool. so many people are watching. Don't cry, don't cry. And I kind of like held back and was like, you know, because you know, like, so many people are sat there watching who know you, and it's like, and then like, I looked up and Jeff's in the crowd came out to Rio to watch me, and another friend of mine, Susie, was there, like, who came out to watch, who's again has known me since I was young in my career. And, you know, it was a real special moment. And you go back in then afterwards and you have to kind of, like, try and throw that away and just be like, right, you're here to perform and lift, but it's so difficult. That's a, that's a good point. Just before you go on, I'm going to interject. Do you think that the, um, the ability to think outside of yourself and soak the situation in is contrary to focusing on the greased groove of the movements it seems to me like soaking the situation in by its very virtue is going to take you out of that routine take you away from what you're used to doing in every every other situation but in every other competition other than the olympics yes but i think that is the most difficult Hmm. one to do especially in like you know, as your is your first Olympics, but even people say to me that have been to multiple, like that I know what to expect the next if I was to ever go to the Olympics again, what mm-hmm. that's going to be like, and you can kind of kind of prepare for that a little bit. But even people that have been multiple times said that everyone's different, <laughs> fucked, and that, yeah. yeah, you're always <laughs> fucked. It's the Olympic <laughs> Games; it's like the biggest biggest stage sport. in the world, right? So, yeah, I think like it does to a degree, um, but I had to kind of put that to one side and remember that I was there to lift, but. You got to remember as well. I'd had the worst couple of weeks training up to this event, and like I kind of just warmed up, and you know I tried my hard. And like the coaches said to me, they said, "Do you want to bring your weights down, and you know just go through some easy lifts?" 
And I was like, I haven't trained my whole life to come here and sandbag myself and look back on it and think I could have lifted more. I would rather have tried my hardest and, you know, got one lift and said, well, at least I went balls to the wall. I just didn't make it. And that's yeah. exactly what I did. Yeah. And I stuck to my plan. I went out and I made one snatch and then missed my next. No, I think I missed my opening snatch, got my second and then mi- and missed my third. And then for the clean and jerk, um, I got my first key and jerk, my second key and jerk, and then missed my last. But they were like, they were ways that I could have done, but like every lift, regardless of whether I missed it or made it, I still finished the lift and soaked it in and enjoyed <laughs> the experience. And like a lot of people would have looked at it and looked at it upon like, oh, he didn't try hard enough, or he he didn't look like he really cared, but like. For me, and for me, that was a bit annoying because like people don't know what goes into that. But I didn't want to walk off the platform kicking myself and think like I knew I wasn't in the best shape and I knew I could have gone lighter and sandbagged it. But I now look back on that moment, still with a smile on my face and with no regrets, and that's what I wanted to do. So regardless of what you know the pub perception was, etc., because they don't know all of that stuff that I just said about you know my sleep, my body how my body was etc six up, weeks to tape it down and then go you know what I mean again. they don't appreciate that they probably even need, never seen you lift before they just go and that's their perception but fine I like knowing myself because at the end of the day I'm the one who has to live with that day that I, well, I tried as hard as I possibly could and I enjoyed every moment of it every second of it and I look back on it now with a smile on my face I retell the story with a smile on my face and I will do again in 20 years time probably um, so yeah, very special moment, but you kind of go on from that peak, the best day of our life, and then reality's here <laughs> and you're back at home and no one cares. No one's there with the big money pot for you, like sponsorship deals, checks. It's kind of like you get back on with your normal life and all of a sudden you've sacrificed your whole life for this one moment and now you're back and it was difficult I think initially because I did feel quite depressed coming back from it and you get those Olympic blues etc and it only wasn't really until um, I started doing the seminars after the Olympics where I kind of found my passion back for the sport again if you like broadly Um, it sounds like a, a version of PTSD almost yeah, it's like you've gone through such elation that there's a there's like a come down on the other side of it. And yeah, but people talk about it all the time, and I think it's genuinely a thing. Olympic blues is a, is a thing, like the Ibiza blues. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I've had them twice this year. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's get on to the seminars now. So you know, I, I, that's how I got to know you was through your lifting online, through the you call it circus lifting. Yeah, it's kind of been branded that now. Um, I don't know if it's a substitute. Um, I guess for me, the circus lifting came about because I watch a lot of weightlifting online. I follow a lot of weightlifting accounts. And I don't know, like, it's going to be a surprise, but I find it boring as shit watching people just posting a snatch weight. And I can't imagine how even more boring it is for someone who has no understanding. They're not invested in the sport. Yeah, but no, like, understanding of the weight and how heavy it is. Mm-hmm. You watch some, you know, I get now that a crazy dude come out and snatch 190 and you're just like, fuck. Mm. And that's it. Well, I mean, as a, another example, to bring it back to ATG or uh, Hook Grip, they'll have on their Instagram, they'll have one video at like 100 frames a second. Mm. And obviously the reason that they do that is so that the technical experts can see just how close the pull is to their legs, just how much they dip under the bar, et cetera, et cetera. But regardless, even the normal speed videos, it's 10, 1500 guys on there all snatching weights, the exact same lift. To me, that's a bit boring. Whereas like for me, I'm like, well, fuck it. Let's jazz things up a bit. Like do something a bit crazy, add a bit of a complex together. And it just gives someone something different to watch other than the same shit the same two lifts Mm -hmm. Dean will make some of these appear as we are talking around the screen thank you video guy Dean Um, so yeah that's how the circus lifting came about Um, 
So let's cut for people who haven't seen it or who are watching it. What's going on around the screen, around our heads at the moment? What's it's happening? me sticking various different movements, lists together um, until basically I run out of energy. <laughs> but it kind of shows like, a, I guess, a real control of the bar and understanding of the technique in order to be able to do that. It's extremely difficult to do. And if please don't try it at home, <laughs> you'll probably hurt yourself <laughs> um, as few people have done. Yeah. So that is, it is essentially that, but I think like as well, and I missed a massive chunk of my story out because um, I have actually done a degree in sports performance of Olympic weightlifting, okay. uh, which I missed out. I was studying at Bath university during um, I guess that time when I was trying to qualify for the Olympics. Mm hmm which I completely missed out, but did four years at university purely at Bath on sports performance Olympic weightlifting. And that's an incredibly specialized sports performance for Olympic weightlifting. Yeah. So what you do at Bath is everyone in my class was either international at their sport of six Olympians in my class and I had a class of only 36 people. So everyone was national, international at their sport. And, um, very set group. You do the course based around your individual sport. So there was, for example, a rhythmic gymnast in my class. So who went to the Olympics in 2012. She did her course around rhythmic gymnastics. So we do different sectors. So for example, nutrition, she'd do nutrition for rhythmic gymnastics. I'd do nutrition for weightlifting. There'd be a psychological um, aspect. And you relate everything back to your sport and do all your dissertation, etc. your your um, studies. What was your dissertation on, and what was your title? Um, the efficacy of caffeine in power-based sports. So. And how how effective is it? Um, yeah, but it is effective, obviously. Um, higher doses for um, power-based sports. So I was, I was talking, I was looking at like real high doses. So we were looking like 600 um, to 800 milligrams of caffeine we were using. Which is what, people. like about 12, 15 cups of coffee, something like that? Yeah, a lot. So, did you see this? Did you see the study that happened at Northumbria University where yeah, someone accidentally someone got given like ten us. grams of yeah. of uh, no, it's fifty grams instead of fifty milligrams. Yeah, someone got given fifty grams of caffeine, or two of them, and they had to be shipped yeah. off to the RVR. Yeah. So I was doing that, and during that time, I was training throughout the day. I'd go home, eat, get in my car at like nine o'clock at night, drive to university, which was an hour away from Bristol study 10 till 3, 4 in the morning, drive home, sleep for three hours, and then do it again, train. So, for how long? Uh, well, I was there for four years, so I had you in term time of that time. Yeah, yeah it's meant I didn't do a lot of sleeping. <laughs> but, um, That's and trying to juggle training with that was extremely difficult. So yeah, I kind of like sidetracked a bit there, but I missed that out. But um, going back to what we were saying about um, the circus lifting, the coaching, like, that was kind of like, I guess, adds a little bit to, you know, what I do now in terms of delivering the seminars, coaching people, helping people with their techniques, etc. I've done the theory side of it as well, as much as... The you drilled things. yourself into the ground with that, right? Yeah. So now you're, as you move forward, coaching people, I know that you're going and doing these seminars where you've got between groups of, what, 10 and 50? What's the, yeah. biggest, what's the biggest seminar that you've done so far? I've probably had 40 people once, but like for me, ideally 20 people is a really good number because any more than that, I don't feel like I'm giving each person any personal attention. And I like everyone, my seminars are just as much about having fun as they are about learning. Mm -hmm. So for me, like I want to try and make sure that everyone leaves that day with individual technical pointers but also feeling like they've met and hung out and spent time with me and got to know me as a person i've been to seminars before where there's 50 60 people and you may even not get one direct person from one direct word from the person that you've paid to go and see so yeah i think for me um yeah i think that's uh so really is your goal your goal at the moment as you move forward obviously you're having a for anyone who doesn't know, we will make sure that Sonny's dates for his tour in... October. October. And you're beginning in October and finishing in January. January yeah. Going that way around that way around the country, the world, sorry. Yeah. Um, through Doha and Australia and finishing New in Miami. Zealand, yeah. Um, broadly beyond that, beyond going and, I guess, accessing as many people as you can up to this 
20 ish limit. Where do you see your career going from that? Is that sufficiently fulfilling for you or are you eyeing up trying to take some young blood and get them to the yeah, highest level think, of the sport or? I think for me, like, like I said, I dedicated 12, 13 years of my life solely to being a competitive athlete and you sacrifice so much, like I said already in that process, I'm 24 years old now and there's a lot of things that I've missed out on and things that, you know, not that I would ever change and go back, I wouldn't, but there's certain things I want to do and live like a bit more of like a normal life. I've been able to travel a lot more this last few years, go on holidays, go to more parties and, um, you know, I want to spend a little bit more time for myself and focus on business side of things in terms of with my seminars and, you know, I'm really enjoying at the moment the um, getting to meet more people, um, building my, I guess, there's very few people out there that provide education for Olympic weightlifting and, you know, want to sort of like become an expert in that field in terms of, you know, wanting to help people um, improve with their lifting. Um, obviously, um, I've made a bit of a um, impact in the CrossFit community in terms of, um, giving it a go myself and obviously a lot of the gyms I go to coach at are CrossFit gyms so um, I'm enjoying learning something new um, a new challenge it's extremely humbling doing CrossFit workouts and sucking at them um, because like I said most weightlifting stuff now I've been doing it most of my life I can do it with my eyes closed yeah. but make me run a mile and I'm dead so, yeah. but that's really nice and I'm enjoying that feeling of having to learn a new skill being a novice at something again. Yeah, and, you know, applying the skills that I learned through weightlifting to something else. Um, so that's enjoyable. And I'm not really thinking, I guess, too much further ahead. As long as I'm happy and I'm enjoying what I'm doing, then that's kind of like the, the key main focus for me at the moment. I do have, in terms of aspirations to compete again, um, I don't know 100% yet. I mean, I got out, I wanted to go to the Olympic Games, I did that. One last thing that I haven't done that I wanted to do as a kid was win a Commonwealth gold medal. And there's potential to come back and do that in um, in Birmingham in 2022, mm-hmm. um, which is, yeah, potentially something that I may look at nearer the time. So would you be prepared to make the sacrifices to your lifestyle again, again. to do that? This is the thing, like, and it's a, it's a really good question because I, kn- I know what it would take to go back and do that. And I think that's kind of good in that respect to know exactly if I wanted to achieve that. Know what you're in for. Yeah, know what I'm in for. Um, And I guess um, I'd have to look at it close to the time. I couldn't definitively say right now that that's a diehard priority of mine. Um, It must be in the back of your mind though. 100%. It's in the back of my mind and it definitely like features as a as a thought as something that I've kind of a stone that I've one of the stones I've left um but at the same time weirdly over the last I guess six months more I guess attention and aspirations has gone to maybe wanting to compete in the CrossFit Games and mm-hmm. like um especially after coming back from regionals and watching the atmosphere of the competition and the sacrifice those guys put in to what they do is it's a hell of a challenge but again like I know what sort of training and dedication it will take mm-hmm. to reach that sort of level of sport and until I'm in a situation where I'm with the best coach with the best training partners um, I'm 100% focused to that goal I'm not going to do it half-heartedly I'd quite rather just enjoy what I'm doing it sounds like a common theme that's sort of come about through this has been a, a single mindedness for mm-hmm. your, you've understood where, broadly where you're going to one degree. And it's funny that it almost sounds at 24 years old, like you're taking kind of like a semi-retirement. Semi-retirement, like, yeah. Um, where you're just like, okay, like, or, you know, you've done, you did four tours in Afghanistan. Like, I'm going to just give me a break and I'll go back out there. Maybe I've still got the skill set. Like, and it's cool. It's, it's interesting to think that, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if young athletes suffer with burnout. I'm sure that a no, lot of them do. Giving my body a rest as well. Like, it's nice not being in as much pain that I was day in, day out before as I was training. And I, I do have other aspirations outside of sport in terms of business aspirations and other things I want to achieve. Um, 
you know so yeah there's definitely other things outside of sport for me there what would you need to what would your total need to be do you think ish at the commonwealth games to be able to pull a gold I know it's heavily dependent on what the other competitors This is the thing, play. like, I mean, anything can happen. I know that it'd need to be probably close to a 160 snatch, which I've done in training, obviously, um, around that 160 mark and clean jerking around the 200, 210 mark. But, I mean... So it's big numbers. Yeah, it's big numbers. It'd need an improvement. But there's guys out there that are doing more than that at the moment that, you know may continue to go on they may move up a weight category all the weight categories have changed now and mm. for me weightlifting as a sport it's it's really struggling um and i think although crossfit's raised the awareness of it a lot more i think that now like that is a more attractive um proposition for me in terms Absolutely. of like where the sport is and where it's going and um, do you see could you see yourself competing in crossfit over the coming years yeah, like definitely. Local, I local mean, I'm comps doing, and then building up. Yeah, I'm doing a charity one for Battle of Cancer with uh, the one in October in London. Yeah, so I'm competing in that. I might be um, competing against you. Uh, yeah, well, I, I quite like <laughs> I my hope team. I, don't go, I hope I don't go head to head with you on a, a single rep. <laughs> Got Zach right George. Here. Have you? Yeah, Zach George and the Lean Machines with that team. So pretty solid team. Well, I mean, even if you don't win, you've probably got the most Instagram followers if you pile them together. So. <laughs> yeah. That's that's number one. Um, um, but no, yeah, definitely. Like, I'm not, I'm not putting too much pressure on myself because, like I said, for once in my life, I don't have to. Um, yeah, that's cool. It must feel very liberating to have something that's um, that's kind of close to what you've done before, but also it must feel like a holiday, like a holiday doing the same thing that you've always done to a degree. Like it's kind of there's a lot of crossover, but it's also crossover, new as well. Is, yeah, and there's a lot of things that. I think actually having done CrossFit has assisted my weightlifting like, really? and made me learn about the way that I train and how hard I train in terms of, you know, there's maybe doing a little bit less, but training a little bit smarter and maintaining like still different levels of, uh, of my lifting. You know? So we, we talk about this a lot. We've mentioned it on the podcast with Jordan, Paul and Tim before about just how sophisticated the sport's becoming now. And it's interesting that you've got this massive lift off, you know, weightlifting not so long ago included a it was a clean and a press right and yeah. then it was a clean and jerk so it was three components like powerlifting yeah and that changed but because it's been around for so long the adolescence of the sport was like fuck knows when like yeah. early 1900s maybe something like that yeah but with crossfit like the the sites only existed since like 2002 yeah the, literally the site has existed since then and the event that they've done at this year's CrossFit Games, 30 muscle-ups for time, was on the site in 2002. Yeah. That's 16 you, years ago. You say you say this, that, but you look at... You, like, a lot of people thought when I... Because obviously Matt Fraser was a weightlifter, etc. And when they started hearing that I was doing um, weightlifting, move, uh, CrossFit training, they go, wow, he's going to be the next Matt Fraser. And it's like, hang on a minute. Like, <laughs> like they, I'm not being funny how I've done it now. There's very, like... I reckon my value of actually competing as an elite athlete is more valuable than my skills as a weightlifter because mm. these, but even then like you look at what these guys are lifting they're lifting near enough like top level weightlifting weights anyway yeah. but it's a completely different energy system like than it is when you're doing a one rep max lift there's very little carryover I said like my ability to know how to train hard is more valuable than my weightlifting abilities that like, but yeah, I've picked up a lot of the movements quickly because more going back to like what we were saying about having an understanding of the body and how it moves. Um, but there's still so much to learn. It's a very... It's like principles instead of specialities to a degree, isn't yeah. it? That you understand how to eat and how to train and that, yeah. ath- that athletic ability. Of course. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's interesting that CrossFit is bringing to the forefront of people, the, uh, to the forefront of the general public's mind weightlifting and and strength sports in general mm. it's made it a lot more sexy me and you Definitely. me and you a lot of the time when we speak we we make jokes about like powerlifters like you know you are really really strong but you are cursed with like not very interesting looking kit <laughs> like, it's it's but you know like you look at crossfit and it's like a fucking fashion show yeah. To a degree, like, and you're like, every, everyone's able to dress cool and all the movements are it cool. Is a, it is, a, it is a, a bit like a community slash people will call it a cult. 
Oh, in absolutely. Terms yeah. of like, but it's it's strength sports for the for the fucking Instagram era, right? Like, yeah, it's, but you know, it's weirdly very attractive to a very wide diversity of people, and I think it brings people together really well. And that's why I think, yeah, people do class as a community because you know you can have your. 40 year old mum of two training with 20 year old lad that's just been out on the piss the night before <laughs> shack a load of birds you know what I mean train together and they can be completely different abilities and work work out together and bring two very different people together and it'd be like on a level yeah I think um, it's one of the only sports that you get like that which has taken what is typically very individualistic as you said you know I'm sure that you had a lot of friends that you weightlifted with and they would stand around the platform while you were training and support you and stuff like that but there must be times that it feels very lonely. Oh, extremely lonely. And that's what I said like, after training that long, like it's very independent for the last sort of four or five years of my career. Um, yeah, it's shit and it's boring. And like, <laughs> that's why I say to people like it is very boring sport or going into a room full of people training together. It's, you know, it's exciting. Yeah, I agree. I think um, it's, it's a strange, uh, a strange world to be in where you've got such a diverse number of people that are all doing the same sport. And uh, it's really cool to, uh, to hear that you're maybe going to make that transition over. Um, I wish that we could go on, but I'm eyeing up no, the time. I'm dying for a wee. You I need, need a wee. A you've, had too much, you've had too much knock <laughs> You need a beer. I'm full of fit aid. And I know that Shark Club stopped serving wings in about 45 minutes. <sighs> so... I'm going to get you back it? again. It's quarter to ten. Now. Wow. Come yeah, on. We've been going. So, man, thank you so much for coming down. I'll make sure. Uh, can you tell the listeners where they can find you online, please? Yeah. So, mainly on Instagram, Sunny Webster GB. I do have a Facebook page as well, Sunny Webster. But any inquiries you've got about anything, whether it be seminars, programming, etc., as well, you can email me at info, web, at, info at webstar-performance.com. Webstar, right? Webstar, not Webster, Webstar. Ah, exactly. So, man, thank you for coming on. I'm no going to get you back. We've got... We could talk... So much to go. <laughs> I, I, might just, I might just, like, video one of our... Fa- well, I won't video one of our FaceTime calls. That's a bad idea. But no. maybe one of the more PG ones. We could have gone into, like, l- some of those very small aspects and spoken for the Granular whole time. detail. Yeah. Man, well, you know, we'll if, people, if people want you back, in the comments below in YouTube, I'll make sure... I'll give Sonny a kick every couple of weeks and I'll make him log on. And I'll make him go in and have a little bit of a browse through the comments. So if you are watching on YouTube, make sure you do that. Subscribe, Modern Wisdom. Please share the episodes if you want. Follow Sunny online here, Video Guy Dean. Thank you very much. And yeah, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.